All right, so officially good morning and thank you for joining us for the final Supporting Inclusive Practices webinar event of the school year. My name is Kristen Brooks and presenting for us today is a dynamic team from the Etiwanda School District. We have Joanne Jenkins and Carrie Stanley. Before we go any further, I just wanna remind our participants watching now that your video cameras and your microphones have been disabled and you can participate using the Q&A feature in Zoom. I'll be checking for questions throughout the event and our presenters will pause at natural times to respond as well as at the end of their presentation. So please also use the Q&A feature if you're having difficulty with your um, audio, visual, seeing or hearing the webinar. Oftentimes there may be some interference from competing devices logged in at the same time. Uh, so lastly, this event is being recorded and all registered participants will receive the Lincoln survey later this afternoon. Uh, this is not a secret link, so feel free to share it with others who may benefit from this information. All right. So again, our folks today, uh, Joanne Jenkins and Carrie Stanley, thank you guys so much. And I say that on the slide, it says Joanne and Carrie, but when you see your video, it's Carrie and Joanne. <laughs> so <laughs> as you're watching, um, it goes in the other direction. So thank you so much for joining us um, and welcoming everybody today. Um, the purpose of our webinar is um, looking at inclusion or supporting inclusive practices. So the Department of Ed's objective for this grant project um, is for LEAs to build, implement, sustain, scale up and monitor practices. So this webinar today is all about monitoring, um, progress monitoring and what that data looks like, how that informs our instruction and our practices. Um, so everybody who's joining us today are from um, districts or partner districts who are working towards that least restrictive environment. And we really appreciate all your efforts up to, um, up to date and you guys have been implementing these programs. So this is great information about how to monitor what, what you're doing. And so, of course, keep calm. You're not alone. Uh, we are working on this effort, least restrictive environment throughout the state, um, increasing those targets. So um, we are looking at that 52% of including students 80% or more of the day by 2018. So many of our districts are on track, if not surpassing that, um, that benchmark for the folks who've been participating in the last couple of years. So kudos to you out there. <laughs> So what I'm gonna do at this point is turn over control to Carrie and Joanne, and um, they will take us through the rest of our presentation. Good morning, and thank you so much for having us. Carrie and I are excited to share uh, the work we've been discovering um, as we've gone along through this process. So um, as we take a look at our presentation for today, it's really about a data analysis protocol that we're trying to put together for our district so that we can improve, improve the results for our children. And it's been through really a reflective evidence-based approach. Um, just so you have an idea, our presentation for today is around these four big ideas. We'll give a quick inclusion overview of our three focus programs and a little bit um, how it's connected to our district and overall with Gen Ed teachers. We'll go through our implementation of iReady, the diagnostic tool that we adopted uh, last year. Then we'll move to a case study that we're doing, um, that we have done and will continue to do through our induction program that we offer here in the district. Um, starting small scale, of course, and then being able to uh, push that out system wide. And then we'll share with you just a little bit of what we're doing 2017-18 for our implementation. So let's get started. Um, our inclusion uh, implementation update is um, going to start with our preschool. Um, we were blessed to have Kristen Brooks here in our district and really put the boots to the ground and get our preschool program off and running. And it's still moving and grooving in a great way on so many campuses in our district. And so we have just a little bit of feedback that, as you can see on the left, that the parents feel that the program has been so helpful to their children, um, not only in just meeting their needs, but really in the opportunities for them to engage um, with all children. And our gen ed feedback as well is just the same, that it, it helps us um, perpetuate that positive message that we're all humans, we all need love, we all need relationships, and so that's a great place for it to be. As we move forward with our Clouds Preschool, we're going to dig into complete full inclusion and we'll have Mod Severe SDC occurring as well in our 16 full inclusion classrooms for preschool. And each of those classrooms will have about seven or so students on IEPs, along with eight general education students. So we're keeping the class sizes small and just really going at almost a 50-50 with our SPED and Gen Ed students in that process. 
And if you're just getting into preschool and that approach of inclusion, feel free to contact our special ed department or carry your eye and come out and see what's going on on our campuses. With this grant money, we worked with an elementary school called Purdue Elementary, and um, they've been taking on an approach where their master schedule has been really their point of access and support to get them the growth that they've had so far. Um, they've gone through and done caseload scheduling to optimize individual support as well as their common areas of need so that the case carrier has opportunities both pushing in to the classroom for RSP support as well as being engaged in small group opportunities to help meet students individual needs and really grouping them also by common needs, not always necessarily by grade level. As Purdue moves forward for next year, um, they're going to take an approach where the RSP at risk cl cluster classes are um, at each grade level and that the RSP teacher will continue to push in also during our universal access time. So UA time is an acronym for us. I'm sorry, I should have defined it first. We call universal access a time is basically students get what they need when they need it. So um, we've taken time away from core. Um, we of course have our appropriately allotted minutes, but we've included in our school day approximately 90 minutes for the week minimum for every student group, all the way from special ed to our EL to our advanced kids, um, everyone being grouped and regrouped consistently based on data and receiving instruction and support in the areas that they need. So that's been a huge process because not every campus's um, schedule, master schedule, is much like Purdue's, for example. So they're still having their challenges, um, but we're working through it. And so you'll see as part of our plans for next year, we're gonna move towards more master schedules. Another school that was connected to our overview, our inclusion and in our overview is Heritage Intermediate. And I love some of the, the feedback they've shared on the left side with lessons learned is they've really gotten to the point where they understand the importance of knowing your staff, who's capable, who's on board, who understands, and as well as the same thing with knowing their students. That was huge. I think the next best part of this process has been that these are our students. That is the culture on their campus. It doesn't matter who the student is, whether on IEP or not, whether advanced, at risk, or EL, they are all of their students and they're really taking on an approach that they examine as a whole um, when they do their planning both for class schedules and for meeting students' needs and then they drill down um, to the more individual approaches. They've really worked a great deal on student motion, motivation, self-esteem, and they found that that is, of course, as the research says, directly correlated with those academic skills being increased. Their RSP students are not in, instantly identifiable in their classrooms. When you walk into a co-teaching or inclusion model classroom, you, you know, in the past you might have been able to, or unfortunately, most of the time been able to say, oh, they're probably on an RSP student, they're probably on an IEP. That's not happening. We have um, some amazing co-teaching um, going on where they're planning their introduction scaffolds and supports for their students so appropriately that we have all kids engaged in learning, and that's exciting. Um, the last bullet is huge. Everyone's perspective should be that everyone has the ability to do more and we need to raise those expectations for them. So they're gonna build a better bridge between their RSP and their um, gen ed program. They're gonna better define their tier two interventions because as we continue to adopt, much like the rest of you, we are starting to have even more tier two supports. And then they're improving their student study team process, but you'll see as a district we are as well. So, um, if I can just, share a little bit of district info and then I'll pause and you can ask questions if you have them at that time too. So one more slide here. So as a district level with inclusion grant money, of course, um, we had a, a small pot of it, but any money is great money to have. And so what we did was we took a part of that money and we pulled in every general education teacher and we did short versions of training on accommodations and modifications, really helping them understand what's the difference. I think that the misconception our teachers had was that you lower the rigor to help the kids access. And so we've been spending a great deal of time showing them how you use the concepts and skills of the standard so you don't lower the rigor 
unless of course the student's IEP or specific deficit skills need you to do that, but that's done more in an intervention approach. But during the classroom setting, we offer those supports that actually keep the rigor, but allow the students to have access to the instruction and learning that they should have. We've moved to full district RSP teachers and aides pushing in to support their students. So we have some campuses are moving in a direction much faster than others, but that is our ultimate goal. And the other, as I already mentioned, was our universal access time, that 90 minutes per, group, per week where students are grouped and regrouped. And basically, we're working towards um, sites having all hands on deck, RSP teachers, aides, and really digging in to meet student needs. One little last tidbit was really not fully impacted by inclusion was our induction program. Because of induction, the CSTPs that exist and our expectations with accreditation for our program that we offer here in our district, we have been using the four attributes of formative assessment, which allow nicely for that analysis of data and really clarifying those learning um, targets so that teachers know what they need to teach and bringing to the table, what do my students know and what do they need, and then planning the instruction that way. And we've had some good success. And so, Kristen, I'll take a quick pause here just in case anyone has any questions. Yep, I don't show anything in that q and I just grabbed remote real quick and okay. nothing yet. Um, let's check our chat box in case people are using that. Nope, just people still saying good morning. So we're good to go. Perfect, okay. So, um, as we move forward, uh, we realized, much like every single district had um, also realized, and Christian, if you can, I, the remote didn't come back to me. <clears throat> Go ahead. Thank you much. That um, much like every other district has realized is that um, as we wiped clean our CST approach and we're implementing Smarter Balance and those standards disappeared, we were then trying to all be asked to rebuild kind of this approach to assessment and just discovering what was all involved with Smarter Balance. And our district, of course, like many others, had benchmarks, and those went away when we shifted to the new standards. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about um, our implementation, a little bit of the training, and really the focus and purpose behind um, the why of what we do. And we all know this is important, so I'll take just a brief pit stop at this slide, is that data analysis is really at the heart of improving instruction. And as we were shifting to new types of assessments, new standards, that's where we were figuring out that our teachers need so much more support. And we're still working on it. There's just not enough time in the day and the year to all of that out. And so our teachers, our administrators are really, really digging into um, an approach with Smarter Balance where we can, but we all know that it doesn't go down to the actual standard and skill level. So that is where we discovered our need. And so it's important for us to understand those assessments, to identify patterns of student strengths and really getting to the heart of their needs and more um, explicit skills and then really identifying those students who excelled and those that required assistance and really taking what do, what do kids who do well need and how do we apply that to others um, and help every student succeed. And then of course is coming within the plan to implement and really evaluate how that approach is working. So really our purpose for the iReady goes back to a little bit of what I said, to rebuild our district assessment cycle. We had no more benchmarks, um, we don't have uh, we didn't have as many common assessments as we had in the past with the 97 standards. We needed a common assessment or approach to a benchmark, and we weren't certain what we were looking for at the time. Um, we also wanted data related to foundational skills and standards, so not just going green as we used to on the CST 97, but really realizing that in a district who performs pretty decently on CST as we move to the new Common Core standards, uh, we have kids who aren't reading also. And so it was important for us to include that in our approach to moving forward. And of course, what reports and data were going to be provided so that we could have our teachers analyze pretty easily to determine what was their best approach for instruction. So our irony implementation, I won't go nitty gritty on the slides because you have it there in front of you, but basically we're in the second year of rollout. We administer three windows. Uh, we also have um, some of our campuses, Title I campuses, uh, purchase a piece that's included with the diagnostic is um, something called their um, iReady instruction that literally takes and individualizes for each student on the computer based on their performance. So while we're receiving di diagnostic data around foundational skills and skills and concepts that go with the standards, we also have some of our most needy campuses that are getting actual instruction tools online 
to support those areas, those deficit areas. We've been moving forward with our district data days, and last year we had a really informal analysis of classroom level data. Um, this school year we took it up one more notch um, so that we wouldn't, uh, one, scare our teachers away, but to keep it on a manageable level for everyone as we just can, uh, are starting out on this implementation. So we took a look at student growth and those students on or below grade level mid-year, and we developed a plan for change to see if we could just put one more smart thing in place for them to show improvement. So basically, we're rolling on this, know thy impact, diagnose what students do and don't know, intervene and evaluate your impacts. And we're using the cyclical progress monitoring cycle of formative assessment to help us move in the right direction. I'll go ahead and answer your question. Thank you, Charles. That um, he's asking, are you using iReady to help us organize our um, groupings for universal access? Yes. Um, we have a couple different missions that we've been discovering with our iReady data. One is we can um, export all the data at a district level because we have a better impact that way. Because some of the reports are helpful at an administrator site level, but if it's a district, if we export the data and we actually then um, add a few tags to the students, whether they're RSP or their gate, whether they're EL, we add in their uh, color coding based on their performance, whether they're more than two years below, more than a year below, or they're on level, so that we can kind of literally do several types of sorts. The other thing that we've been experimenting with this year was kind of a composite approach to it, where we take and consider in um, a classroom grades and smarter balance so that we're finding dual purpose. One is that in the big composite level, we can say to campuses, we can help you build classes and then you, after we build classes for you that are pretty heterogeneous or set the way you'd like to, you can then bring the human factor in and look at which kids behaviorally need different support, which teachers are the best match for these students. But for universal access, we're also finding that we can take a dual approach. Some of our composite um, approach with the iReady data is around those foundational domains for literacy, for example. It gives us phonological awareness, gives us um, phonics, uh, high frequency words, vocabulary, literary and informational comprehension. When we literally composite based on um, vocab comprehension and depending on the tier of intervention we have to bring in phonics too but what we found is that helps us make our groupings for universal access so the teachers aren't having to do it individually we can provide it to a whole campus and a whole campus can either break it down by teacher if they're deciding to do their grouping in their own classroom or by grade level if there's a whole grade level team working together we have a few campuses that are getting very creative and are our very tier two kids who are really deep in that tier, they're actually ignoring the grade and pulls, pulling base on me. So yes, in the, in the short answer, we are using iReady for so much of that. It's been amazing in the information that we're receiving. Well, let's see if I can get the slide to move forward here. Kristen, for some reason, the slide is not moving forward for me. I'm not certain why. Do you accept the uh, control? Yeah. Let's try again. Got it? It did. Yeah, let me turn one more time. There it goes. Thank you so much. I love technology. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So in a sense, here's our outcomes. Develop a protocol based on iReady assessments for diagnosing, intervening, and evaluating and then to understand how a collaborative inquiry approach. So we want to inquire on what our students know and what do they need to be able to do and where are they in that process so that we can take our special edu education students to really make the gains in reading that we know they're possible of showing. The other would be then, and, and it really applies, that, that second bullet applies to all of our students, but because this is an inclusion webinar, this is our true focus right now. Uh, we also want to consider how this collaboration and developing protocol might be scaled for similar effects school or district-wide. So that there connects to our whole population and also um, where we can take it to every single special ed um, student and meet their needs in a, in a most amazing way. So as we move forward, um, we have some uh, slides for you on the specific iReady uh, PowerPoint presentations that I'll turn over to Carrie. Um, she's 
our special ed expert um, in our department. She's been gen ed and special ed with her credentialing, and so we have the best of both worlds with her right now. Well, thank you. It's so nice to be with you guys, and I will be going um, over some of the data pieces and how we better use the data to actually match our instruction for our students. So when we're um, looking at a protocol for our district, uh, district wide, we are looking at, um, for general education, making data driven decisions. So um, on iReady, um, it gives us several reports. So I'll be giving you kind of just a brief overview of the reports and how we utilize them. Um, the instructional grouping profile is one of the reports that we receive from iReady. And this gives um, us uh, groupings based on how our students are responding to the system. Um, and um, their proficiency levels within the, uh, the skills that they're given. So this is this instructional grouping profile is groups of students based on the same grade level. So if I was a classroom teacher in a general education class teaching second grade, it's going to group my students by similar need level. So I'm going to have like five students that possibly need phonics and vocabulary instruction. And then I have another profile that has um, a different criteria all the way up to the, the five um, profiles. So this really helps our, our general education teachers in being able to provide UA groupings and be able to group their students based on need so that when they're actually providing the instruction in UA, they are able to then pull resources or pull um, instructional materials based on those needs. And then it also assists our, our general education teachers when they're planning. When they already identify that our student is struggling in a phonics area or a phonemic awareness area, when they see that in their instruction, um, in their instructional core material, they then can provide scaffolds and supports during core as well. So it, it serves dual purposes for not only UA instructional purposes, but also as I'm using or planning for my core instruction, I know my students needs right off the bat. When I go into more of what um, our special education uses these reports for, um, especially in RSP, we know that our caseload span grade levels. They're, we don't usually typically have a case carrier just with one grade level unless that grade level is pretty big um, at a particular school site. So we know that for our, our RSP programs, we need to have a report that's going to give us information across grade level spans. So we use the class profile report. This then gives us information that will then break down um, all of my students on my caseload into, into the domain areas. It's gonna tell me uh, overall, my whole entire caseload may be, have a deficit in phonics. They may have a deficit in uh, phonological awareness. So then I can, as a teacher, plan my instruction based on my program needs and, and also have an instructional focus based on the program. So then when I look at individual students, so that's giving me the broad picture of what my program needs, but then I need to dial it down further of what each individual student needs in my caseload. So then I use the, the student profile report, and this provides individual instructional needs. Both of these areas, there's two types of data that I'm given when I'm looking at my student profile report. I'm given my on grade level performance. So based on the skills and the, the questions that I'm give, given as a student, I'm then being able to see uh, is my student or does my student have the skills necessary necessary for that stand or those standards in that grade level? And it gives me uh, an on grade level uh, band right up here in uh, test one, test two. It gives me an on on grade level performance as well as deficit skill area domain needs as well. So I'm not only tracking if my student is performing on grade level or not within the those skills um, and standards, but I'm also given. Um, deficit skill areas for the student and also strengths. So we use this to really identify um, strengths and deficits across domains. And then it also provides me um, access as a teacher to see as each student tests in, in all those diagnostic areas, are my students making progress as I'm giving them instruction? So the, it gives me two different types of data on that one. When I dial it in even more based on the domain area, 
then I'm able to see what strengths and weaknesses and, and next steps for instruction in each particular domain area for my students. So we use this particularly for IEP writing. It dials down, it tells me exactly what standards my students have mastered or skills have mastered along with what I need as far as um, deficit areas to work on so that my students then have um, access or we're, we're giving them instruction in those, those, those de deficit areas. So then um, I'm able to then group my students into more intensive reading groups or math groups based on um, the level of instruction for next steps for my students here. So when I look at all of my data, um, what really happens with um, iReady is it gives us um, an actual target. Once um, it's called a growth target, um, it at every single grade level, it produces a target level for our students to make at least one year growth within the, not the standards, but the actual skills. So we, what we really want to be doing as a district is really capitalizing on that growth target and being able to see the impact of our students. Are our students making skill progress in those skills areas to make those targeted years growth? And not necessarily is it going to mean that my students have mastered all of the standards within that grade level to make a whole grade level growth, but what we're looking for is the skills in which the students may or may not have deficit areas in, but we're, we're trying to capitalize on the year's growth of skills. And so when we look at 2015-2016 data, when we were um, pulling this for iReady, we were able to see that as a district, um, most of our students, we have RSP in the dark gray and then Gen Ed in the lighter gray, but all of our students district-wide were making that one-year growth target in skills. In, in being able to attain one year's growth of, of another, of a, a, a whole year's of skill set growth in that area. So we also have here not only just our district wide data um, of growth towards target or percent towards targeted growth, but we also have our um, two school sites that are part of our inclusion. Um, that we're tracking as well as another school that we decided to put in here too as well because this is a school site that we are are monitoring for um, not only need but also because we have a, a teacher an RSP teacher that is also in induction and so we wanted to see um, can we also make the same gains with uh, this school site as we have with the others. So looking forward, um, when we looked at their 2015-16 data, what we really wanted to be focusing on is shifting towards a more learning-driven dri culture uh, and making sure that we are, are really mastering and, and figuring out our data to match that to instruction and see the overall effects in our students' growth and performance. So we're not only, um, as a district-wide, uh, looking at classroom formative assessment, we were really um, honing in on that and really having those, the teachers do that cycle of diagnose, intervene, and actually provide instruction. Um, and that's part of the formative assessment. But we're also looking at our UAA time, our universal access time, and capitalizing on really providing um, targeted instruction for our students during this time. Our principals have goal meetings that they then have their individual focus for their uh, school sites. And then our induction teachers, these are our brand new teachers, also have inquiries where it's a data-driven uh, approach using the formative assessment uh, process that we really want to uh, capitalize on using data, matching that data to instruction, and seeing the overall growth. And then, uh, like Joanne said earlier, we are um, double timing it with student study team. We revamped that right now in the process of revamping that to really make it more of a data driven centered approach so that we are seeing growth in our students and really seeing it, our students making that those gains. And ultimately it goes down for our special education students to the IEPs. If we have really good data that's going to tell us what our students need, we are then ultimately having growth, not only in our IEPs, but growth overall in our student success. There's a question. Oh. Where did it go? I'm going to open it for you. Oh, we just got it. We figured it out. <laughs> this is easy to use. 
Um, yes, so the question was who is providing targeted instruction to each of the UA groups? Do the grade level teachers share that duty? Yes. Um, our UA time is uh, a gen ed a function, uh, but our RSP teachers are also in the mix. Some of our school sites um, have this going full force where their RSP teacher and the gen ed teachers are in the mix helping their at-risk kids and yeah, their most intensive kids, not only RSP, but also at-risk students as well. So we have it double duty uh, right now in our UA, but then our RSP teachers are also um, finding additional time to help those students if they see more of a need. And then it's also dictated by their IEP based on their service minutes. So thank you for that question. Um, then the next thing I'm gonna go over here um, is um, our collaborative inquiry. So taking that one school site that we had a need area there um, we were looking for, can we capitalize on, on an additional piece that maybe possibly we're, we're missing? And if we take it to one school site, we then can see, is this being successful? And if it is, how can we roll this out into um, being possibly district-wide? So we wanted to start out small with an induction teacher and, um, and see if this is going to work for us. So I'm gonna give you kind of a little bit of uh, what we did with this program and then kind of give you a background of the school site and the teacher. So we obviously wanted to look at the data, the need. Um, this school site, we saw that there was a need and we needed to really look at the data to then make program decisions. And based on those program decisions, we were then able to uh, put together student groupings based on um, this teacher's caseload. So her um, student groupings may uh, show that they were deficit in more foundational skills. So we needed to make sure that we provided also foundational skills instruction that could um, further her along in being able to be more successful um, with her students and the, and the growth that we were seeing with her students. So um, we then went from the groupings based on similar group need, we were then able to have an instructional plan um, and really target that instruction based on those deficit skills that we were needing for each of those groups. And then we also looked at program monitoring. So what uh, progress monitoring, um, I should say, and really making sure that as we were providing the instruction, we were being able to see, our, do our students have, have my students mastered that skill and move on? Or do my students need some reteaching and then possibly provide that, that instruction there too as well? Well, so this kind of just gives you a drive-by of kind of the process that we went through. Um, and here is the, the data that we were actually seeing from that program. So when we looked at it, yeah, the initial data, this was the very first, at the very, very beginning, our first diagnostic. So um, this school site um, had already guided reading already in their um, UA time. So we know that UA, uh, guided reading was part of the program already, but we were still seeing deficit areas in our students. So we were, we were really concerned that um, we needed to add something else to, to that mix because our students were seeing success and we were seeing gains in that area, but we weren't seeing as much of a gain. And so we really wanted to test out um, possibly putting in an intensive reading approach to see more gains in other areas. So when we looked at the, t the data across the board for this particular teacher, we saw that majority of our students um, in, the in the vocabulary comprehension of literature and comprehension of informational text, that m all of our students were two or more grade levels below. And how can we capitalize on getting those students more towards target? So then we started looking at, we also see deficit areas in phonologic awareness, phonics and high frequency words, and we weren't capitalizing on that just yet. So we looked at that and the area of need um, for her students she had 97% of her students were one or more grade levels below. So her focus was going to be in phonics instruction. Um, she was going to tie in phon phonological awareness and high frequency words as well, but her main focus was going to be in phonics. 
And then doing that, this was what we ended up doing with her program design. UA at that school site is five days a week for 30 minutes. And so her school site, she does a push in UA services uh, for 30 minutes. Um, and she provides the instruction with also the gen ed teachers. So it is a collaborative approach um, for the most intensive um, students at that school site. So the guided reading was three days a week for 30 minutes. But then we also wanted to capitalize on that foundational skills instruction for not only her um, RSP students, but her at risk students as well, um, and really target those students. So those other two days a week, um, she was going to um, provide that intensive instruction to the at-risk students as well as our RSP students. And then she was also going to carve out some additional time for as an as-need basis based on the student's IEP and the service minutes that she needed to provide for additional time for her targeted instruction for her RSP caseload. So she was able to do push-in services and pull-out. Um, Sarah also, the um, induction teacher that we are working with, she also um, does kind of a collaborative approach as well during core. So she not only does this during UA time, which is five days a week, but she also provides instruction during the core time to provide additional support to teachers uh, for a, a specific accommodations and provides uh, teachers with some support in the classroom um, with students that may be struggling with a particular topic. So um, this particular teacher does twofold. She not only helps with the core instruction, but she also helps with being able to provide instruction for deficit skill areas as well. So based on that, in a four month period of time with just implementing the extra piece of intensive reading instruction, what we were able to notice in four months period of time that 222% of uh, her overall growth in all of those areas was over 222% growth towards their end year target. So all of those students were, were exceeding their, their growth target and, and going beyond. And 80% of her caseload had met their one-year end-year target growth um, target for those skills that they needed to master. And that was just with the implementation of uh, intensive reading instruction. Alongside was also guided reading, which that school site was still having. So it was going twofold. We were working on the comprehension piece, and we were also working on the foundational skills instruction. And if you see here on this um, report, that um, the percentage that I had in the previous slide that said that um, a lot of her students were one or more grade levels below, she had half of her caseload move in just the phonics area to just one grade level below. So no longer are, were our kids uh, functioning at multiple grade levels below, now we were just at one grade level below because we really worked on those foundational skills that those students were missing. And not only did we see the improvement in just the phonics area, but we saw the overall improvement in the comprehension level. As students were being able to really understand words and decode words, they were able to really understand and comprehend text more fully. And so you were able to see also that our students, more than half of her caseload went from multiple grade levels below to just one grade level below in comprehension as well. So we really saw the impact on, on providing this intensive reading instruction as well to these students. In just four months. In just four months. So at, as um, our district is, is we, we look at the iReady data and it's, it's great data, but we want to make sure that everything is transferring over. So as a district, um, too, we use Fontes and Pinnell reading levels for guided reading. And so we wanted to make sure and see, were these, are we seeing these types of gains, not just in the iReady report, but were we seeing it in multiple measures? And when we went back and actually reassessed all of our students in the guided reading levels, we were able to see that in 2015, 2016, that majority of our students were, were gaining. We were seeing a, a really good gain. Um, our students were going a couple reading levels within a year's time, which is really great. But when we ended up putting in that um, intensive reading instruction for our, her students on her caseload, we were able to see that her students in four months period of time, that they were able to go multiple grade level spans within just four months.
So you see that this area right here that our students were going from um, maybe a first grade reading level to now a third grade reading level in four months. When we look at actually bringing it down to actually a, a student data and um, really figuring out if the students were seeing the impact, not only the caseload was seeing the impact, but the individual students, we were able to see that at the first diagnostic, we had a student that was performing at a first grade uh, level in overall performance. And you see that in some areas they were lower in domain areas and some that they were higher, but the overall reading level was about a first grade um, reading level with, with skills. And so with providing the four months um, of intensive reading instruction, we were able to see that the student went from um, a first grade level in skills to now a third grade level in skills. And this student is a fourth grade student. So this student went from multiple grade levels below in, in their skills to all the way up to a third grade um, level in, in um, performance skills. And they were able to do that with the intensive reading instruction. So this student now is at one grade level below um, in that. And so we, what we wanted to do and what we still wanna do is continue to work on that momentum of getting our students the most amount of skills that they possibly can so that it can transfer over and that we can see that impact overall in their performance, not only in their their intensive instruction, but also into the classroom. So when we look at the student's reading level from 2015, 2016, the student was making pretty good gains with just um, isolated guided reading alone. But when we added in then that, that instruct in uh, intensive reading instruction, we were able to see the huge amounts of gains in four months period of time. The students started off at a B level, which is a kindergarten reading level in 2015. And in February, that student was at a third grade reading level by just capitalizing on those skills. Mm -hmm. One year later. So, um, ultimately the inclusion and um, the intensive reading instruction um, the impact that we've seen um, overall has been significant. So this is still, we're looking at a growth towards, uh, the percentage of growth towards the target, the end year target of skills. And overall our district in one year by just taking this more um, intensive data analysis approach across the district, at the beginning of 2000, or at the end of 2015, 2016, our district um, wide was around 100%. We have now almost um, made a, a quarter percent gain on that uh, district wide for both our RSP and our, our general education students. And you can see also in um, East Heritage when we took that case study that it too went skyrocketed because we were able to take on that dual approach, not only inclusion but also um, intensive reading instruction. And then our two other sites too as well, we're able to see those great gains as well in both general education and RSP. So overall, the growth that we've seen, the impact between 2015 and 2016-17 school year um, has been tremendous. As we see district-wide, we've been able to see um, our students have really, really good gains. And what we ultimately want to keep continuing to see is that the RSP um, band is, is exceeding our general education band. And that's what we strive for in the um, years to come is to constantly have that gain <laughs> in RSP, that there are, our students are making those one or two grade level um, gains in their, their skills. So in looking at all of that, you can obviously see that from our case study, we're like, wow, how do we get this to every RSP teacher? How do we get this to every gen ed teacher? How do we stop the SST? Let's send everyone to special ed assessment plans and the, our level of do not qualify is just through the roof. And so we see the potential in this. It of course is gonna take us time. We don't have a very large crew in our district to pull this off, but we're gonna take it on one thing at a time. So here's a little bit of what we're looking forward to for impact and planning for 2017-18. And so these are kind of like part of our top six. 
starting at the left, going across the top, and then I'll go across the bottom row, our professional development. We definitely have to, as we see each teacher, uh, whether we're working on um, our fourth day for ELA implementation, that will be our second year next year with the program, we're starting with data. We're starting with who are your kids, what do you know, what do they know, and then how well do you know what you're about to teach? So we will help them also deconstruct standards and dig in in that sense to know what they need to do. Um, the other thing we'll do is take a closer look at our special ed teachers and helping each and every one of them to be certain that we're writing IEP goals that are directly directly connected to student need. You know, what we find in the past, and we're still finding on, on IEP goals, is that they're, they're kind of arbitrary sometimes, or they're not directly tied to the specific deficit skills that exist. So we're tracing grade level standards that the student's sitting at back to their present levels and writing goals in that sense so that we're hanging on to, um, especially our RSP students, that core grade level that, there's, that they have the right to have access to. Um, we're moving to site master schedules. We're working slowly but surely with all 16 of our sites, soon to be 17 next year, that their UA time scheduled for students is not just scheduled, but that literally it has an RSP collaboration so that the RSP teachers and aides are all hands on deck for core instruction supports in the classroom pushing in, and as well as using that time to help meet student needs. And in some cases, it might be some at-risk kids along with caseload kids based on um, grade level by that time, or they're, like I said before, campuses that are just aligning kids based on need. It doesn't matter the grade level, but we're starting with their, their deficit areas. The other is our student study team. We took our student study uh, approach, referral approach, and hung on to its cyclical process, tightened it up, um, the implementa implementation for next year is around the four attributes of formative assessment, and it's really um, bringing to the table with the student strengths and what do they need using data to drive our decisions and bringing in the whole child of what are the child's interests and motivation, how can we engage them in more opportunities in the school climate and culture, and really build that child and see the potential in our outcomes for our student study team are to study a student to help them progress. Our outcome is not to determine special ed place assessment or not. That's That might be one of the final decisions you can make, but the true intent is to find success for all students. Our district-wide day-to-day. We will be taking our case study approach and our induction approach to all teachers on day-to-day -day this year and asking them to dig in in a really purposeful way. See how that happens. Mm -hmm. um, also, our induction inquiry, we're going to continue what we do, but really make sure that we amp up the level of data attached to what we do so that we can help our newest teachers continue to understand the standards that they're teaching. And based on that, here's what your students bring to the table. Now let's make better decisions. We adopted McGraw-Hill's Wonders for elementary, and there are lots and lots of parts and pieces to it, and a teacher cannot teach everything. If a teacher shows up and turns the page on the book, they're not going to meet their students' needs. They have to make decisions doing whole group and small group as part of their core instruction. iReady has a new tool that is in place. Um, I believe it came out this year, if not earlier. Uh, we aren't using it yet, but we're gonna pilot with a few people. Um, we'll definitely take on some induction teachers as a case study and a few other sites that can, and take a look at how those can serve as um, progress monitoring assessments to these concepts and skills that we're really drilling down to. So. We'll see how it goes. We're hoping for the best. Um, we thank you for your time. Um, we'll open it up to questions now, but this is just our little Etiwanda approach to digging in and seeing what we can do to really help students' needs. So are there any questions? Right. <laughs> thank you, Charles. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, really, really appreciate it. I'm gonna um, try to click on this and see if I can open up um, any of our other questions here. Let's see. Oh, a nice comment. Uh, yes. from Charles. Thank you, Charles. I'm calling you out on that. What you guys are doing is amazing. Mm -hmm. Did I not tell you? Like I told you. Um, <laughs> and he says, we're struggling with the same issues, SST, RTI, UA, et cetera. It is not pretty around here. Yes. <laughs> um, and that's exactly why it was so important to you know, bring this all to you guys, because um, I've seen it firsthand what this team is doing. And, and uh, Joanne was not kidding that they do have a skeleton crew. Although they added a couple folks, it's like, oh, wow, we got a couple more to do you know, 17 schools now. So, <laughs> so um, 
amazing, amazing work. And, you know, that one slide that I showed before, we're really, we are in this together. You're not alone. And so the more we can share this information with folks, get the message out about what people are doing and what's working and being honest and authentic in our challenges and our successes, I think that's how we're all going to come together you know, as a state and move forward in the same direction. So, um, so Charles, you, you hit it on the head. That's exactly right. This, this team's fantastic. And, um, and, and notice how you guys have talked about, you know, rolling it out. This is year two, you know, you're still going and now you're going to pilot. So you're the, the go so, slow to go fast, but at the yes. same time, once you guys have gotten your information, you've reacted um, and you've put a plan in place and that's huge. Um, long gone are the days of, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that next year. We'll get into that next year. It's like our kids are getting older. <laughs> you know, you see the, the student profile you had where students three years behind and bumped up to now one year behind. And that's huge. That is huge. Yes. The student is still behind. Oh my goodness, the amount of gains that student has made in a four month period of time is unbelievable. And it's due to your dedication and your triangulated data and huge. So you guys are fantastic. Thank um, you. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. We'll, we'll give one more shout out. You see, I get all excited about what you guys are doing. So I know people out there. Um, if you guys have questions following this webinar event, please be sure to um, send me a note. I'll pass that on. Um, you know, let, chew on this a little bit. If you need to watch some more, um, or watch the webinar again, you definitely have that um, opportunity to do that. Um, I'm going to move us forward a couple of slides. We got through the the question part, um, just a little motivation for you at the end here from Vince Lombardi, the achievements of an organization are the results of the combined effort of each individual. So when you're out there and you think you're the only one fighting for the kids and fighting for, for data-driven results, it's not true. <laughs> We're all over California um, trying to work together, but it, it is the combined effort of each of us together. So that's your little motivational slide. Um, a big thank you to everyone who's participating today. Uh, contact information if you have questions about this webinar. There is one Q&A, let me open this. Oh, anonymous, this was awesome, thank you. So huge, huge kudos to our team there. Um, and then lastly, of course, we have a survey monkey that I'll send out to all the registered users or registered participants, I should say, with that link. So please, please um, fill that out, that helps us. Um, see what we're doing right and what we need to keep growing on um, and especially as we're planning for next year. So um, stay tuned for what the uh, Supporting Inclusive Practices grant will be like in the future, but hopefully you all will still be on board. That's our plan anyway. So give us some feedback on that survey and um, that would be fantastic. I'm checking Q&A again. We have a couple more. Um, could I download the slides? Yes, those are going to be sent out to all of the um, participants as a PDF. And so as soon as Zoom finishes the recording and uploads it to the cloud, they'll send me a link and I will then attach everything and pass that on through the OMS registration system. For those of you who may have been using somebody else's um, link, Zoom link to join, if you just email me, then I'd be happy to um, pass that on to you individually. Um, and so let me go back and just show you my contact information one more time in case you need to write that down. Um, so just send me um, your email address and a request for those slides and I'll be happy to send that to you individually if you're not a registered participant. All right, so we got you guys out a couple minutes early, which is what we all want as the school year is wrapping up. So before we uh, stop recording and head out, I just want to thank Joanne and Carrie again so much for your time and effort putting this together, not only for the webinar, but what you're doing for kids. So Thank you for having Wanda rocks. You guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.